Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, your invitation. It's always a pleasure to be, to be here or to be in this uh, format because b the location is changing uh, as far as I understand. Um, let me, let me uh, say just a few words on um, what I have in mind to, to tell you. I would like to uh, give you some hint on uh, unconventional monetary policy, what we did in the crisis. Uh, I had uh, the privilege, it was a sad privilege, but also a very, very impressive privilege to be four years um, as president of the ECB in the crisis from uh, 07, where we had the subprime crisis and the start of the subprime crisis until uh, 11, when, end of 11, when I left, and when we had not only the subprime crisis uh, in 07, not only the um, Lehman Brothers collapse and uh, the heat of the global financial crisis uh, starting in the US, but also the start of the sovereign risk crisis that we experienced uh, in Europe. So that, that makes a lot, of course, of uh, observation and, uh, and experience uh, to try to communicate. Um, as I said, I would like to uh, tell you what I understand from uh, my own angle of vision on unconventional monetary policy. Uh, I will elaborate a little bit on a concept which I am very, very keen on, which is that in the crisis, I found uh, a tendency, a very strong tendency for uh, major central banks in the advanced economy to be closer and closer. I call that conceptual convergence. And uh, it seems to me that this uh, rapprochement that we had on, a, I would say, principle basis, on a conceptual basis between major central banks of the advanced economy is something which is due to the crisis, is closely associated to the crisis, and uh, might be interesting because I have to say it's not very often uh, stress that there, there has been such a phenomenon. Whether it will be a lasting one or not in, is another story. Then I would try to conclude on central banking with um, some understanding uh, and perhaps uh, uh, proposals on what is exactly the situation today in terms in terms of conceptual approach for uh, uh, central banks. Now that we have the experience of the pre-crisis period, the experience of the crisis period, and uh, of course we are only starting to have a real experience on the post-crisis period. Whether we are in a post-crisis period is disputed. I am not optimistic at all, personally. I see a lot of reasons to be uh, quite worrying as regards the possibility of new, uh, very uh, acute crisis to emerge at the global level. And I will give you some uh, of the reason why I think that uh, we should not neglect such uh, possibilities. Now, I don't know whether I arrive to one full hour <laughs> during this, uh, with this um, in mind. But, uh, of course, I'm totally open to uh, give you uh, <clears throat> indications on how I see the euro area under the angle not of monetary policy, but the angle of vision of uh, uh, governance, economic, financial, budgetary governance of the euro area, and uh, also I could give you, if, if you wish so, some hints on uh, what uh, are the main avenues for improving the euro area governance or to improving the European Union as a whole. So this is uh, the uh, kind of uh, uh, message I would communicate, maybe only in the question and answers as regards the last part, the governance of the euro area and the future of the European Union. So let me start with the uh, monetary policy, stricto sensu. And uh, as I already said, uh, uh, more than uh, uh, 10 years 
uh, ago elapsed the, the start of the, we, we had the start of the, uh, of the crisis. Uh, for me and for the European Central Banks, uh, it was uh, a very, very uh, extraordinary experience. We had the experience in uh, August uh, 2007 of our own money market uh, totally evaporating, not functioning. The 9th of August 2007, I had my collaborators uh, telling me we have no more any market. There is no transaction. There is no price. The uh, possible potential interest rates are absolutely skyrocketing. And uh, uh, the, uh, in the, the, the spreads between the LIBOR or the Eurobor, as far as we were concerned, and the overnight index swap was absolutely skyrocketing, but so skyrocketing that we, we had no transaction. So we had uh, uh, to cope with this situation. I uh, decided that we could not let our market in such a desperate situation, and we had to embark on some innovation. The innovation was that we decided to give uh, the central banks, the commercial banks of the euro area, uh, unlimited supply of liquidity. And uh, we uh, told them, you will have all the liquidity that you would ask for. They asked for 95 billion euros. We gave 95 billion euros. And uh, of course, uh, such uh, an enormous amount of supply of liquidity permitted the system to function more or less, and at least it permitted us to maintain our interest rates, uh, which were at the time 4%, uh, without having them skyrocketing, which would have created, of course, uh, a very, very bad uh, impact on our market uh, and on all financial markets, and on all, I would say, financial markets in the advanced economy. So that's only f to tell you where I am speaking from. I mean, speaking from uh, an institution that um, had to cope with a dramatic period, had to take decision within a few half hours. We, we took for us three hours to decide that uh, between the choice of being totally unconventional and delivering an enormous amount of liquidity and the choice of doing nothing and uh, observe the absence of uh, functioning of our market. Uh, in both cases, you had uh, assets and liabilities. You had pros and cons. We decided that the pros of the uh, first unconventional uh, measures were, uh, were superior to the cons. And um, I think that experience has demonstrated that it was probably, probably appropriate. Of course, since then, we had a sequence of events uh, after the uh, fact that we had to cope with these uh, uh, turbulences on all markets uh, associated with the subprime, both, I would say, in the US, in the UK, in Europe, uh, we had uh, a period where we could have two, I would say, analysis. Uh, either we could say, well, uh, we were underestimating, underassessing risks in general, in all our markets, uh, the volume of risks and the price of risk in the financial markets. And now, thanks to the wake-up call of the subprime, we are looking at a progressive reappreciation of all the risks on all those markets. And that, of course, was uh, something which was quite reasonable to, to think that we were going through a period of readjustment, reappreciation of risk, reestablishment of, of some, on, some common sense on the global markets, which uh, previously had um, formidably under, under assessed risk. And that, of course, would, uh, would be the positive, say, uh, sentiment uh, at the time. Now, you had also uh, the other option, the other vision, which was, well, it, it was the first earthquake which is pre-announcing an immense catastrophe, an immense earthquake, and uh, we are living in a period which is pre again pre-announcing a drama. I have to say that the first uh, analysis was uh, 
uh, had a majority of the observers, uh, I would say in some respect, unfortunately. The second option, namely we are paving the way now for uh, an absolutely dramatic crisis, was uh, the, the attitude of a minority. You have seen Bill White this morning, I think. Yeah. Uh, I can say that Bill was one of these few observers and, um, and uh, economists that was uh, alluding, and I had a lot of conversation with him when I, I was myself president, and I was not only president, but also chairing the global economy meeting where all central bank governors were trying to devise exactly where we stand and uh, what was the situation. And it was, uh, I, I remember very vividly conversation with Bill White where he was telling me, um, I think we are very close to the Minsky moment. And uh, uh, we will have a, a formidable wake up call that is far beyond what we have observed until now with the overall uh, problems of the, of the subprime. And uh, of course he was right. As a matter of fact, I have to say that uh, if I mention practically all um, economists to, to think that uh, it was unlikely that we would have uh, a dramatic situation, the central bankers were not optimistic at all. Of course, uh, it was, it's always extraordinarily difficult to, uh, I would say, have a certi certainty as regards the uh, future, particularly when uh, the, the future appears very bleak, potentially. But uh, uh, clearly, the idea that we were uh, experiencing uh, something which would be grave because, again, of the formidable underassessment of risks and uh, because of the formidable augmentation of, uh, of leverage in the uh, advanced economies, all advanced economies, by the way, with uh, the percentage of um, overall indebtedness, public and private, augmenting uh, formidably uh, since the uh, year 2000, uh, up, up, up to 07. I'm referring, of course, to years 07, 08. So all this was uh, signaling, again, that um, at least in the eyes of the central banks, that uh, we might have to, to prepare for times that were uh, even more demanding. Still, during this period pre-Lehman Brothers, we had all to take a number of decisions. I will go back to these decisions, which were uh, quite, uh, quite impressive, because part of the uh, overall, uh, what we call uh, unconventional measures, particularly in our case, uh, a large deal of unconventional measure measures were associated with this idea of giving liquidity without any limit, without uh, any uh, uh, ceiling, uh, in order to be sure that uh, absolutely all our uh, commercial banks would have all the liquidity they were asking for. That was new, and that was, of course, something which was really quite extraordinary. In the U.S. also, they before Lehman, crisis, uh, Lehman Brothers, they had introduced a number of extraordinary measures in order to give liquidity much larger, uh, in a much larger way to um, the um, overall uh, financial institutions in the US. At the very beginning, it was only a fraction of them that had access to the money of the central bank. And um, we have also, of course, uh, other measures which were taken including the start of the swaps uh, of the currency between the major central banks, again, before Lehman Brothers. All this, of course, took after Lehman Brothers a formidable expansion. So let me go very rapidly. I already, already uh, did that uh, a little bit, but very rapidly on, on the causes of uh, what we have observed, why did we in uh, 07, 08 uh, had to cope with the worst crisis since World War II, which uh, in the opinion of many, and I share that opinion, could have been the worst crisis since World War I, namely could have been even worse than uh, the period 2930s. Uh, that is, of course, something which uh, uh, remains uh, bizarre. 
and uh, remains very bizarre that uh, we had to cope this dra with this drama, uh, taking into account that uh, the mainstream, um, I would say, uh, analysis of uh, global uh, economists was that, on the contrary, we were in a period which was a very good period where we had uh, more or less, uh, uh, I would say, succeeded in uh, mastering the uh, business cycles and the economic cycle, that uh, we had a low level of volatility as regards um, uh, growth uh, of the real economy and that we had a low level of volatility <coughs> as regards inflation. So uh, we call that the great moderation uh, period, uh, which uh, uh, was you know, uh, associated, as I said a moment ago, with something which was uh, uh, very, very obviously very dangerous and visible, and which was the uh, augmentation of leverage. Still, uh, again, uh, we, we were in, a, in this situation, which is, uh, again, very highly paradoxical, and it should be for us, uh, of course, a lesson for the, for the future. I will go back to that. <coughs> so, very rapidly, if I try to go through the major causes of the advanced economic crisis, I would say that uh, we had um, a number of causes that are probably associated with the uh, scientific and technological progress coupled with the globalization, the two being very, very closely intertwined. Uh, in the domain of the uh, uh, possibilities offered by technology, I think that uh, the extreme sophistication of the financial instruments, the expansion, formidable expansion of uh, securitization, the invention and, uh, and generalization of derivative markets uh, of all kinds, the uh, uh, shadow banking, uh, generalizing at a global level, new industries being created like hedge funds and so forth. All this uh, <coughs> was closely associated with the technology permitting all th those sophistication and interconnection. And of course, it was uh, something like exploring a new, new avenues, exploring new continents. We had not explored those sophistication of markets and of uh, financial instruments before, so it was absolutely new, obviously. And uh, uh, of course, from uh, such uh, new adventures, you might discover new challenges, uh, even, uh, possibly uh, new major risks that were uh, not yet uh, deciphered. Uh, I mentioned already the interconnectedness. It's something which, of course, is even very, very, uh, uh, as I said, connected with the globalization. But the fact is that we had an extraordinary increase of uh, interconnectedness between all financial and non-financial institutions, markets, economies, at all levels, I mean, at national levels, continental levels, international levels. And, and this is, of course, something which uh, also, um, if I take the analogy of, uh, of uh, physics, would be, you know, giving birth to uh, emerging property. You have a new, uh, a totally new regime for uh, uh, global finance and global economy. And that, of course, has a, a lot of uh, consequences of all kinds. Uh, I already mentioned um, a, a third major cause, which was the sentiment of tranquility and confidence, which uh, appeared to be, with the benefit of the hindsight, absolutely dramatic. But the period going from mid-80s, uh, mid I would say, to mid-2000s, was a period where, at least in the advanced economy, the idea, again, that we were living in the best of the world possible was uh, very, very powerful. And associated with that, there was, and it would be a fourth possible cause for the uh, global crisis of the advanced economy, the uh, consensus of the international community that uh, markets were efficient, 
that uh, not only uh, market were efficient, but uh, they were more or less uh, driving uh, the economies of the, of the advanced economies and the economies of the world also in the direction of uh, an overall equilibrium uh, that was single and uh, was permitting to have full confidence in the fact that uh, if you let market economy function as uh, spontaneously as possible uh, to the extent that the perception that there could be multiple equilibria and there could be uh, possible uh, absence of uh, efficiency in the market behavior, uh, all this was more or less absent of many, many meditation, many reflection, not absolutely all, as I already said, but uh, clearly uh, the uh, efficiency of, uh, of, uh, of uh, financial markets was uh, really dominating, uh, particularly, uh, I have to say, in, in the uh, US, uh, I would say, perception, the Chicago uh, school. And uh, I have to say that one has to recognize that the Fed itself was giving uh, a lot of uh, credit to this idea that uh, one, one should have confidence in the capacity of, uh, of um, uh, markets to be efficient. Uh, a last reason, I already mentioned the last reason, which is uh, uh, dominating, in my opinion, uh, what has happened, was that uh, uh, the overall uh, leverage in the advanced economy, not in the emerging economies, not in the so-called uh, third world emerging economies that had been touched themselves by the Latin America crisis in the 80s, by the Asian crisis in the 90s, uh, uh, and I'm also speaking of, of course, a lot of uh, countries in, um, in the Middle East or in, uh, in Africa that were trapped in the uh, sovereign risk crisis of the 80s and of the 90s, all these countries had not embarked on an, an, an episode of a very, very uh, dramatic uh, leveraging of their economy, uh, and um, for good reasons, because they had experienced already the uh, difficulty that is associated with that. But in the advanced economy, clearly, there was uh, no, I would say, understanding that uh, we might have big problems associated with the big, big jump that we had at the time uh, between uh, the, um, uh, both, I would say, in the public uh, sector and in the private sector. To give you some orders of magnitude, when one looks at, uh, it is disputed, there are many methodological uh, uh, <laughs> concepts, but if uh, I refer to a work which we did in the G30 at the time I was chairing the G30, which is a think tank of uh, Washington. When we looked at the overall uh, outstanding debt as a proportion of GDP at the beginning of uh, 2000, we were approximately, according to our methodology, at 250% overall public and private debt, global, all countries uh, on the uh, overall GDP of the planet. When uh, we started uh, the, the crisis in 07, 08, we had 25% more of the global GDP in the uh, overall uh, public and private debt. So we were at the level of approximately 275%, uh, and uh, 25% that had been accumulated were accumulated by the advanced economy in the proportion of 90%. 90% of the augmentation of uh, additional uh, indebtedness, public and private, was to be attributed to the advanced economy. So you see, it, it's uh, over seven years, seven, eight years, 25% of the GDP, uh, when we were already at the global level, at a level which uh, was signaling that we were already uh, uh, leverage, uh, quite, quite substantially leverage. Uh, 
So this was totally neglected for many reasons. Uh, all, all the reasons I have already mentioned, the fact that the uh, <coughs> signal that we were receiving from the real economy were, as I said, the signal of the, uh, uh, I would say, uh, very good behavior of both growth and uh, of uh, uh, the overall uh, uh, inflation, which was uh, stable. So we, we had the feeling, which was wrong, that we could, ha if we had stable prices, it would probably mean that we, we were uh, in a world of underlying stable finance. We know now that it's not true. But again, uh, I think that we can forgive the fact that we missed a number of um, emerging property which were associated with technology, with globalization, with the new avenues that we were exploring, as I said. I think we can not be forgiven for having totally missed the uh, augmentation of, uh, of uh, outstanding debt, public and private, in the advanced economy. And I have to mention, en passant, that as regards the concept of monetary policy that was, that were, was totally dominating at the time, the idea that you would look at the uh, overall credit, that you would look at the augmentation of credit as an, an information that was important from the standpoint of a central bank, was not accepted. Uh, the uh, ECB had a concept of monetary policy where we had two pillars. One pillar which was uh, uh, the pillar of uh, economic analysis, which was shared more or less by all uh, other central banks, and a pillar that we would call the monetary analysis, which was uh, looking at the uh, overall monetary aggregates, at their component, but also at their counterparts. And, and that was disputed. We were considered very rear guard uh, to affirm that we were also looking at the uh, component and uh, counterparts of the monetary aggregates, including uh, private credit, including public credit. Uh, of course, with the benefit of the hindsight, we see that it was probably a mistake not to consider that credit should be also looked after uh, quite, quite carefully. Anyway. Uh, I would uh, like now to try to elaborate a little bit on the uh, experience of the unconventional monetary policy that, uh, that we had uh, in the crisis. And uh, if you look at the uh, literature, you will see that there is very much a dominant interpretation for the unconventional monetary policy, which we can understand pretty well because uh, times has elapsed. and. Uh, the idea that the uh, sole uh, justification of uh, the uh, quantitative measures that were taken, say QE to oversimplify, but there are a number of quantitative measures which were taken by the central banks, uh, all central banks of the advanced economy without any exception, uh, were uh, um, to pursue uh, monetary policy uh, conventional monetary policy, say interest rates, when the interest rates were at zero, when you had attained the zero level bound, and uh, that you had to continue to be as accommodating as possible, because it was what was required by the uh, real economy and the situation of the real economy for many reasons, including the fact that the uh, uh, neutral rate could be at zero level themselves, or even negative. So all this uh, ha has created the sentiment that quantitative measures, unconventional quantitative measures, are justified only by the fact that you must continue to be as accommodating as possible, even when your interest rates are at a zero level. Uh, I think the, this is only one of the uh, reasons why we embarked on uh, unconventional measures. And uh, in the future, if we have, again, to uh, embark on some unconventional measures, uh, and more, uh, enfin, the most often, uh, on quantitative measures, but you will see also that it is a little bit more complicated than that. But if we have to embark on, on such measures, 
then uh, we uh, must be conscious of the fact that there are several goals, several avenues that these measures can try to cope with. The first uh, that I would mention historically is uh, when you have a grave and immediate threat of collapse of the systemic functioning of the financial sphere. So you have, you, you're put, uh, you're immediately put into question as regards the functioning of the, the financial sphere. Say that uh, you have the feeling that uh, there is a house of cards which is about to totally collapse. Or, or you have a market which is not functioning at all. Nothing, nothing is observed. The, uh, you are in a situation where you can be at a level of interest rates which is not zero. It was, I already mentioned, it was 4% in our case when we embarked on illimited supply of liquidity at fixed rate. Uh, the United States of America embarked very, very uh, boldly in unconventional allocation of liquidity or in purchase, massive purchase of uh, tradable securities at times where they were coping with uh, uh, the crisis, the heat of the crisis, and um, it, we were not yet at the level of 0%. And even the justification which was given on both sides of the Atlantic of what we were doing was not that we were, uh, uh, we had to cope with the zero level, the zero bound, but that we, we had to cope with unexpected, extremely grave threats uh, of uh, dysfunctioning, total massive dysfunctioning of our markets. So I don't want to elaborate too much on that. I could be very, very long on that. But uh, re you, you have to remind yourself that this is something which is historically true. We, we started the very bold measure, the swift and bold measure, uh, at a moment where the threat was not that we were foreseeing a very, very grave depression or a very grave uh, recession ahead of us. It was simply that we could see the immediate and grave threat of collapse of the financial system, of the financial functioning of our market. A second dimension of unconventional measures, as far as I see it, is also not clearly closely associated with the necessity to pursue a monetary policy at uh, the zero level bound, but uh, not in between, if I may, between the total disruption of market and a partial dis 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 disruption of market. So, uh, some kind of uh, malfunctioning of market. When the private sector which was used uh, to, in the normal time, to make you know, market functioning in uh, all advanced economy, and so particularly in the US where you have to get in mind also something which is very important. In the US, you have practically, and you had at the, before the crisis, 75% of the financing of the US economy, which is made through markets, so tradable uh, securities, uh, public and private, uh, that, are, uh, that are negotiated uh, in the market. And only 25% uh, are uh, uh, attributable to, to banks. So that makes uh, an immense difference with us in Europe, where we have exactly the contrary. Uh, before the crisis, we had only 25% of the financing of our economies, uh, which we could be uh, associated with markets and 75% which could be associated with banks, which also explains a lot of the difference between the decisions taken in the US and decisions taken in Europe. But uh, whatever the universe where you are, whether the uh, commercial banks are uh, the major uh, supplier of credit to the economy or whether it, it, these are the markets, in both cases you might be plunged in a situation where if you let the banks uh, operating uh, without any help, and in particular on the money market, uh, as regards the, uh, I would say, allocation of liquidity, uh, it might not work correctly at all. And uh, in Europe, for instance, today we are uh, we have progressively got out of the 
acute episode of the crisis, uh, that's absolutely obvious, still this illimited supply of liquidity at fixed rate is still the rule in Europe because the central bank, rightly so, I, I guess, thinks that it is still necessary to be sure that all financial institutions have access to liquidity and uh, that uh, uh, we cannot rely upon the functioning of the market between banks uh, to permit an appropriate allocation of liquidity. Uh, and uh, in the United States of America, uh, after the acute episode of the crisis, as you have seen, uh, we had a, a very, very active presence of the central bank on the uh, markets by uh, purchasing uh, market QE1, 2, 3. Uh, QE1 was not called QE1 by the central bank itself, but by the market. But uh, anyway, the, the, the presence of the, of the central bank was uh, very visible. But even after the um, uh, interest rates increased in, in the US, you could see with a great caution in the attitude of the central bank of the United States of America in dealing with the portfolio of uh, tradable securities they have in their balance sheet. So one can see that uh, the idea that the, the, the we could not necessarily let the market functioning in, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a way which would be as uh, uh, spontaneous as possible. And uh, you, you remember there has been a, a long period when the uh, central bank, after having stopped the net purchase of uh, treasuries and uh, um, tradable securities, continued uh, to be um, very keen on repurchasing the uh, f maturities that were falling, uh, falling due in order uh, to uh, continue to intervene with great subtlety on the market. So you can interpret that, it seems to me, as this second goal of the innovative and conventional measures, namely substituting partially to a private sector functioning, different, uh, as I uh, explained, in the US and in Europe, uh, if the central bank thinks that, again, uh, we might not be in a situation which would permit uh, the economy to live freely as it was the case before without the uh, active support or passive support of the central bank. And then, of course, you have the third dimension, which is uh, uh, mentioned uh, by uh, many, and I said it's, uh, of course, now a dominating interpretation. I don't dispute the fact that it is a dominating interpretation, but I, I think that it is important to be fully aware of the fact that uh, things are a little bit more complex and more, um, more um, I would say, uh, uh, interesting to, to analyze. Now, just one word on, on the complexity of the um, uh, unconventional measures. Uh, I mentioned, I concentrated because it's uh, uh, simpler, on uh, what I call the quantitative uh, interventions of the central bank, namely the purchase uh, of, uh, of tradable securities summed up by Q, the, the expression QE. And also, I mentioned, in the case of, uh, of the European, the importance of uh, uh, having embarked and maintaining the uh, concept of illimited supply of liquidity, which is not a normal functioning for a central bank. Uh, to give you an idea of the complexity of uh, these non-conventional uh, measures, let me mention on this side of the Atlantic, namely in Europe, that uh, we have embarked on a specific European uh, uh, concept which has been to target a number of peculiar tradable securities, namely historically first uh, the Irish, Greek and Portuguese treasuries, that we purchased in May 2010. I was president of the ECB. 
So we, we decide, in a way, these were quantitative measures and very heavy quantitative measures as regards those countries which had a very low level of uh, GDP. But uh, that was not QE in the sense that it was not uh, uh, expanded to all the economy of, of Europe, but uh, it was really to combat a crisis which was specific in the three countries I have mentioned at the start of the sovereign risk crisis in Europe. But these are, of course, uh, non-standard measures that were, at the time, very heavily criticized, by the way, by uh, a number of observers and, uh, of course, by uh, public opinion in some countries. Fancy, the central bank is embarking in purchasing Greek treasuries. Uh, uh, they are intruding in uh, uh, part of the uh, domain of the, of the government. So this is fiscal policy. The central bank is uh, vagabonding in areas that uh, are not uh, uh, its area normally. Um, and of course, uh, we did the same in August 2011 with Spain and Italy, which was also something quite extraordinary. But as you see, five countries had their treasuries purchased by the central bank in 10 and 11. These are unconventional measures, but specific to the, to the euro area. Another set of measures that are uh, in the uh, realm of unconventional measures are, of course, the forward guidance, you know, the idea of giving in advance maximum amount of uh, information to the market's participants on what the central bank will do in the future. Uh, it was not done, only the, the Japanese were doing that before the crisis of 07 08. In the crisis of 07 08, this idea that uh, we could be helped by embarking on a very, very uh, affirmed forward guidance was something which uh, appeared to be uh, appropriate. And uh, by the way, uh, I think it was uh, uh, one of the weaponry that we needed at the time, even if it has also uh, assets and liabilities. There is another uh, concept or category of, uh, of uh, non-conventional measures that I would like also to uh, tell you about because it's not mentioned generally, it's not mentioned anywhere. And uh, uh, it is because it is specific to Europe and this is the off-balance sheet commitment. In a way, the forward guidance, when you say I will not increase rates uh, before a very long period of time, you are taking some kind of off-balance sheet commitment, of course. It is not visible in your balance sheet. But uh, in the case of Europe, uh, the fact that we say, until today, uh, if uh, any uh, commercial bank uh, wants liquidity, it will get the liquidity without any limit. Uh, today, I think that the eligible collateral to the central bank refinancing would probably be something like 3 or 3.5 trillion euros, all taken into account. Uh, it is a multiple of the uh, liquidity which is asked regularly by the uh, commercial banks of, of Europe. So you have an off-balance sheet commitment which is there and uh, which is uh, uh, of an immense magnitude, as you see. There, there is no, the, the Fed doesn't say, I can give uh, liquidity in a totally unlimited basis. Uh, um, I would also say that the OMT, which is uh, the promise the Central Bank of Europe said, uh, made in uh, 2008, in saying if a particular country has major difficulty, as it happened in the past for, uh, Greece, uh, for, uh, for Greece, Portugal, Ireland, and of course uh, uh, Spain and Italy, and I mentioned already, then we intervene. But if it happens again, if there is something of that kind, then the central bank is able to mobilize itself and purchase those, uh, uh, I would say, tradable securities, namely treasuries, uh, provided 
there is a conditionality associated. And uh, that was the promise of OMT. Again, it, it is an unconventional measure, uh, a very important uh, uh, unconventional measure, which proved uh, quite uh, effective uh, at the time in terms of diminishing massively the spreads uh, between uh, the, the best signature in Europe and the worst signature in Europe. But it is also quite uh, impressive to see that it is totally, totally off balance sheet. And by the way, it was effective and there was absolutely no purchase of that kind. So if you look at the balance sheet of the, of the ECB, you, you see no trace of this off balance sheet commitment, which had not to be uh, operational. So I mentioned that uh, in order for you to see that the central banks in the crisis, in the worst financial crisis since World War II, uh, had a, a very large, uh, I would say, set of tools uh, that were uh, introduced, that were, I think, necessary and uh, I think there is a large consensus on that even if each of these uh, unconventional new tools can be of course uh, analyzed through the angle of the uh, drawbacks associated with it or the of the possible uh, liabilities associated with it in the future and uh, uh, you could say that uh, of practically all measures that have been taken which uh, uh, will drive me to conclude in a short period of time because I see that time time is elapsing much more rapidly than I was <laughs> expecting. And I see that you are nodding. <laughs> so so uh, uh, the, the great danger of all those measures, of course, which were, again, taken because we were in a terrible crisis, whatever responsibilities uh, are uh, of, of the crisis, but we were in a terrible crisis. And the danger is, of course, that the, the central bank, having been very active, very highly responsible, uh, might be considered by the other partners, and I'm speaking both of the public sector, governments, parliaments, and of the private sector. They might be considered, uh, uh, I would say, substituting themselves by their boldness uh, to the other partners, governments, parliaments, and private sector. And if it were the case, there we will certainly pave the way for the next dramatic crisis. There is absolutely no doubt of that. And this is a, a very important danger. That's the reason why I think the central banks are very, very uh, uh, wise in their communication, always to stress the point that they are not the only game in town, that uh, the other partners must step in, and it is particularly true in Europe, of course, where you have still uh, immense responsibilities of the governments and parliaments, the countries themselves, uh, if uh, we refer to the past, and, but also to the future, and also the European institutions, which have to be up to their responsibilities themselves. But it is not by chance that in the mind of the people, the central bank is really the anchor of Europe, the anchor of the euro area. Uh, this is not only because it has been uh, swift and, as I said, responsible in its reaction to the dramatic crisis, but it's also because the other one do not appear as being uh, themselves uh, as responsible as they should and as um, Solid, solidly anchoring the uh, euro area and the European Union as they should. So now I, I have only a very short span of time, namely five minutes, no, maybe a little more after all, because we didn't start exactly yet. So, uh, yeah, a, a I, I can, it's a little bit flexible. Okay, so that's, that's you're very generous, very generous, I appreciate a lot. So I, I would say a word on the conceptual convergence because I had said in advance that I will tell you something on conceptual convergence extremely rapidly. And then I will tell you how I would you know, conclude for, uh, for the, the central bank policy today and uh, 
what are, uh, in my opinion, the, the, the main points that uh, we have to be fully aware of and w what are the dimensions which are, have to be disputed and are still open, at least in my mind. So, conceptual convergence. I, I already mentioned that uh, we could see in the crisis, due to the crisis, uh, many elements where uh, central banks uh, that were far away from one another in terms of principles, in terms of uh, conceptual understanding of what was monetary policy, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, I would say, precise definition of their goals and so forth, I could see, again, in the crisis, uh, this rapprochement. So I will only list, and then we, we could, of course, have questions on that. One, one of the uh, important, of course, rapprochements uh, is the fact that nobody now says that we should, should not look at the credit dynamics, at the, as what I call the counterparts, the credit counterparts of the monetary aggregates. Uh, we were paid dramatically to understand that <coughs> it could be very, very important for central bank to have a better understanding of that. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, we have converged uh, on the concept of monetary policy. Uh, there are still a lot of central banks that are, uh, I would say, associated with pure monetary targeting, even if now, of course, the financial stability goal becomes part of the overall responsibility of the central bank. But uh, the, the US is not associated with monetary, uh, with the inflation targeting, uh, but reserves the right to look at everything. And as you know, has two goals, which are given to the three, uh, which are given by the central bank of the United States by the Congress. One is price stability, another one is low long-term interest rates, and the third is uh, 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 jobs and uh, low unemployment. So th that is given by the Central Bank of the United States by uh, the uh, uh, Congress. That being said, the uh, Central Bank of the US said before, even said in the crisis more or less, and could say any time uh, that uh, price stability in the medium long run is a precondition for delivering on the other uh, goals that are uh, given by law to the central bank. And uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is something which has been said very, very clearly by uh, uh, Alan Greenspan, by Ben Bernanke. And of course, one of the justification of giving a precise definition of uh, price stability, namely to mention the 2% as the goal for price stability, is part of this uh, theory that price stability is a precondition for meeting the other goals. So that, that is one. Another element of convergence is that uh, uh, there is more or less a consensus to say that the best place for locating banking surveillance or is the central bank or close to the central bank. It was not the case at all before the crisis. The UK was had the leadership on the FSA, which was totally out of the central bank. Uh, in Europe, uh, in the euro area, as well as in all the European Union, you had two schools. The schools of those who were saying the central bank must be very close or responsible to uh, banking surveillance. And uh, the other school was saying, no, uh, not at all. No contact between banking surveillance and central bank. Uh, and the, the US uh, was more or less uh, in between the Fed having responsibility, but uh, uh, in a very complex uh, system of surveillance. Uh, now we are in a universe where in the UK, it is the central bank. In Europe, Euro area, it is the central bank. And so the convergence has been absolutely colossal. And even in the US, nobody is saying the surveillance of, uh, of big banks, big institutions should be out of the realm of, uh, of the Federal Reserve, even if there has been criticism on, on the Federal Reserve. So you see that this is an element of convergence, which seems to me very important. 
uh, the same uh, as regards the prevention of systemic risks. On both sides of the Atlantic, you have now new institutions where the central bank is playing quite a large part. In, in Europe, I have been myself as president of the ECB, president of the European Systemic Risk Board. And uh, uh, clearly, uh, it's part, I would say, of the emerging consensus that the central banks have a special positioning that would permit to make them, I would say, important, I wouldn't say alone, but important in trying to prevent systemic uh, uh, risks. Of course, this is also associated with the handling of what we call macroprudentials, uh, which is also part of the overall evolution of, uh, of the uh, understanding of uh, what uh, is necessary in the, present, uh, in the present world. And there is, again, a consensus, particularly on both sides of the Atlantic, to think, and, and also in the UK, to think that the central bank has responsibility in the handling of macroprudentials. Uh, another element, which is also Im important in my understanding, is that we also converge as regards communication. Communication is very important for the central bank in normal time. It's extremely important in crisis time because uh, informing, uh, on, only because the democratic accountability makes that you have to inform uh, your fellow citizens on what you're doing, why you are doing this and that. Uh, and that is, of course, something which is extremely important for independent institution. Also, the fact that uh, uh, you are uh, communicating as soon as possible in real terms is important. We have converged uh, to the extent that uh, more transparency has been generalized, and also the fact that uh, uh, the press conferences that were uh, introduced in Europe, in the ECB, for reasons that I can explain more uh, thoroughly in the questions, because uh, uh, we had to be sure that uh, uh, it, the, the decision of the central banks would be understood in the same fashion and communicated in the same fashion everywhere in Europe, in the many countries that are uh, composing Europe. So uh, from the very beginning, we understood that immediately after the decision of the central bank, it was important to have uh, this kind of uh, overall uh, press conferences. But now, as you know, there are press conferences in the US, press conferences in the UK, press conferences in uh, Japan, and so it has uh, generalized. I think it's, again, uh, something which is important. And of course, uh, I, I had reserved for uh, the last uh, point on convergence, something which I consider very, very important, which is the fact that before the crisis, we had no agreement on what was price stability, concretely, what was price stability. Uh, some were saying it's close to 2%, others were saying it's 2%, and uh, two major central banks in the advanced economy, the Japanese and the US, had no indication at all on what was price stability. At the moment I'm speaking, be because of the crisis, in my own understanding, uh, and in the occasion of the crisis, in the time of the crisis, both the US and Japan have said our definition of price stability is 2%. So that the four central banks of the advanced economy that are issuing the currencies that are in the basket of the SDR, you know that these four are the sterling, the yen, the euro, and the dollar. And on top of that, you have now the renminbi, which is an emerging country which will play a more important role. But I'm speaking there of the four advanced economies that are in the basket of the uh, SDR. They have very close definition of uh, price stability. And they are aiming at stabilizing anchoring as solidly as possible their own uh, uh, inflation expectations, medium and long term, around 2%. So same 
same goal, same sentiment that after all, anchoring as solidly as possible expectations in uh, the present uh, uh, world where we, where we live, which is full of danger and full of, uh, of uh, potential difficulty is a good thing. I, I think that this is perhaps the clearest, because it's arithmetic uh, demonstration that in the crisis, without any kind of consultation between the central banks, that there was not a meeting where they would have said, well, finally we'll decide. No, it was a decision that were taken totally, totally independently by the various central banks concerned, but the, the result is there. And of course, it's up to the economists to say 2%, it's bizarre, why 2%, why not 2.5, why not 3%. Why not 0%? I mean, and and I, I expect that we will still have, of course, a lot of discussion because, because it's clearly something which has been very pragmatic. Uh, of course, I see personally a lot of reasons why 2% appear to be uh, quite a good hankering for medium term. Uh, uh, and medium and long term inflation expectations. But uh, that being said, again, it could be discussed. But I expect that because any change would be uh, full of possible uh, drawbacks, uh, including when I was myself president of the Central Bank of, of Europe, we had some in the IMF uh, starting to say 4% uh, would be better than 2 at a time where we had a lot of difficulty already to be sure that the interest rates would be as low as possible and we were practicing, as I already explained, uh, conventional and unconventional measures to try to have uh, uh, interest rates as low as possible. So I was telling the IMF, look, uh, do you realize that if you say that we are now a goal of 4%, of course, uh, the uh, spreads on uh, all uh, interest rate markets will augment considerably because they have in mind 2%. Now they would have in mind 4% if we are credible. And, uh, and then we will augment the nominal interest rates immediately. So it's extremely dangerous to do that. And of course, um, one uh, uh, could also argue if there is no move up on uh, all uh, the interest rates market, it is then that we are not credible. We, can, we could say 4%, but nobody trusts that uh, we will deliver. So it would have been also a, a dangerous point. So I mentioned, I mentioned uh, the 2% the convergence as something which, uh, which is certainly important, which doesn't mean that uh, it is the end of, of the story. Now, I will really conclude. Uh, first, to uh, mention why I am still extremely worrying myself. You remember 250, 275. What do you think, where do you think we were? Uh, the last figure I have in mind was probably uh, 16, uh, 15, 16. Uh, what, where do you think we were at a global level in terms of percentage of debt outstanding, public and private, upon the uh, uh, global uh, economy GDP. Uh, would you say, well, we stabilized after the crisis because the wake-up call has been terrible, so we are uh, hovering uh, uh, around uh, 275, or we had a very strong diminishing of the rapidity of the leverage uh, augmentation. So we are probably at 285, so it continues to augment, but much less. What would you say? 300. 300. So it continued after the crisis at the same pace at, as it did before the crisis. So this is something which we must uh, have in mind, in my opinion. Of course, uh, as I said, the uh, advanced economy were responsible for 90% of the augmentation before the crisis. They had, of course, a terrible wake-up call. So they, their contribution now to the augmentation of the uh, leverage is only half, not 90%, not half. The other half has been taken up by the emerging world. And the emerging world has started to augment its leverage considerably 
uh, after the crisis, in, in, the cri in the crisis of the advanced economy and after. And uh, uh, China is uh, a case in point because uh, the leverage in China has augmented considerably. But it's true for all emerging economies. And so, uh, of course, it's a very gross vision. You, know, you look at the planet and you say, this is a big important indicator for the planet. But if there is any truth in the fact that we are dealing with a global economy, that interconnection, interconnectedness has, uh, uh, is the rule of the game, that uh, globalization is still there and still operating, uh, if all this is true, then uh, an indicator at the level of the planet is not necessarily a bad indicator. And again, if this indicator has some, I would say, authority or uh, reliability, then we have all reasons to be today even more worrying than we were in 07. So I, I don't want to, uh, je ne veux pas vous assombrir trop, I don't want that, that you would be desperate, but I think we, we have to be aware of, of the fact that something is wrong in the present functioning of the global economy, we probably have a bias, a pro-debt, and against, uh, we'd say, we, what is not debt to finance the economy in general, namely both uh, in many, many countries, taxation, which is a good way to finance uh, uh, the, the uh, the investment or the, the deficits of the, of the public sector. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, as regards the private economy, we need much more equity. We, we, we cannot continue to pile up debt because piling up debt is driving you necessarily to crisis. And the, the price of a crisis is obviously considerable. So we, we need equity to be the uh, general amortizer of the global economy. So I let you meditate on that particular point. And all the other points I wanted to make, I will let to the questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again, uh, Monsieur Trichet. Uh, we are Brenda, who is from Argentina and comes from option A, which is innovation, and I'm Benedict, I'm from Germany, and I'm in option B, which is more macroeconomics. Um, we, we're gonna discuss based on what you've just said, so give a short summary, then we're gonna discuss based on that a possible alternative framework for monetary policy, that Brenda's gonna do that. And then I will, as food for thought, give a little provocative uh, politically, political economy explanation on the rise of populism, which might necessitate the adoption of such a new framework for monetary policy. Thank you. Um, so, making a brief recount of the very insightful presentation uh, that you have uh, made, um, there has been, as a reply, uh, from central banks of advanced market uh, economies uh, to the financial crisis, um, a conceptual convergence uh, in some points. Uh, one of them is these unconventional monetary policies that at the beginning of the crisis they were developed as great easing and great support. Um, it is later on that they began to be used as quantitative easing, that is lowering the interest rate beyond the zero uh, bound. Uh, but usually it's this um, last form, uh, the interpretation that dominates. Uh, this uh, has uh, has some consequences that it reduces the flexibility of central banks uh, because this high correlation between unconventional and conventional monetary policies uh, doesn't enable it to apply them in different directions. Um, it is also risky that uh, QE is viewed as normal monetary activity uh, since it has redistributive effects and it stimulates aggregate demand. And these are not um, aims that central banks should pursue uh, in the medium long run uh, because it might put into question its legitimacy and independence. 
Uh, and in a sense, um, due to this dominant interpretation of unconventional monetary policies, central banks are facing difficulties uh, in abandoning them. And as a response, there is this convergence to forward guidance policies. But there has also been a conceptual convergence uh, regarding uh, price stability around uh, 2%, uh, and also about this new goal that is uh, financial stability. Um, and we would like to pose uh, that it would be interesting including other, tar other targets alongside inflation targeting and financial stability. Uh, so from the mid 80s, uh, there has been this um, dominance in inflation targeting uh, because it is considered fundamental to achieve uh, higher growth rates of productivity and because uh, it is considered that it is fundamental uh, to achieve a financial and economic stability. It is later on, that as a consequence of the crisis, that it is questioned that uh, price stability leads to financial stability, uh, and uh, this new goal is established, uh, which is an important recognition due to the inherent financial instability of economies, and due to the interdependence between monetary, financial, uh, and economic stability. These interdependencies have been addressed by central banks in pragmatic terms, but they have been uh, seen as something uh, more transitory rather than permanent. So why not also other targets? For example, Epstein has argued that no target fits in all circumstances and they have to be defined in each period. Uh, we would like to argue, for example, that uh, in our times, the distribution of income uh, could be an interesting uh, policy to be addressed by central banks. Um, this will be addressed later on by, uh, by Benedict, considering its relationship with uh, the rise of populism. Um, but going to this idea of uh, price stability to achieve economic growth, uh, why not persuade um, full employment and growth targets alongside inflation and financial stability. Wouldn't it be more effective? Uh, because the interest rate has asymmetric effects on aggregate demand. It usually has more depressing effects rather than stimulating effects. Um, Arestis and Sawyer uh, have studied that it has larger, um, that rises in the interest rate has larger effects on investment and on long-run growth uh, than on the inflation, than on the um, inflation rate. Uh, and there is substantial empirical evidence that Phillips curve has a long mean segment which is completely flat, meaning that it is possible in these situations to uh, increase um, employment rates or the use of the productive capacity without affecting inflation rates. So in these circumstances, uh, applying contractionary monetary policies uh, wouldn't be uh, effective. But to achieve uh, this um, employment targets or full employment and growth, it is uh, fundamental the coordination between uh, the fiscal and monetary policy uh, because both of them um, affect uh, the same the variables like, such as aggregate demand, uh, the exchange rate, uh, the distribution of income. Um, besides, monetary, financial and economic stability uh, depend on the coordination between the monetary uh, and fiscal policy. This was addressed in the middle of the financial crisis. These interdependencies were pragmatically uh, acknowledged. Uh, for example, when the Fed um, bought uh, private assets from commercial banks uh, with uh, treasury, uh, exchanging them for treasury bills, and when it ran out of these treasury bills, it asked the treasury to release new ones, even though it was not necessary uh, to get engaged in public debt. Um, but it is usually argued that this is transitory. Um, as Mr. Trichet has said, it is very important that, um, or usually it has been given too much importance to uh, the monetary policy, uh, and it would be important that the fiscal policy uh, was given a more, more, more role, more importance, uh, but fundamentally in a more uh, structural basis and in coordination with the monetary policy. It is usually argued that uh, this would put into question the legitimacy and independence of central banks. 
Um, but an alternative framework would be thought that enable at the same time a more democratic institution uh, guaranteeing uh, the independence uh, of the central uh, bank at the same time. For example, Vivo has suggested uh, as an alternative a mandate which sets out areas for cooperation with the government, a joint committee structure to handle that cooperation, and a good set of incentives for central bankers. Um, going to the case of Europe, for example, uh, Arestis has suggested the possibility that the European Central Bank could be made accountable to the European Parliament. Uh, now Benedict will, be ad will address this in a more broadened view uh, from the perspective of institutions or European institutions more in general. Yes. So we just heard, uh, I would say, in mainstream or public terms, a rather provocative suggestion how uh, monetary policy could be done differently. Now, I want to make a case why we should think about such radical solutions or such radical policy changes uh, to jumpstart a subsequent interesting discussion. What I'm going to argue is that we are at the breaking point of history, that the international technocratic institutions like the central banks, OECD, etc., do notice that, do uh, adapt to that and are learning they might have noticed that too little, uh, too late, and therefore are adapt adapting too little. Um, because of that, the too late and too little, I argue that mainstream politics, and I define mainstream politics as politics by the large established old parties, is stuck in what I will call the cynical trap. And this cynical trap causes populism. Another cause for that populism is inequality. How that all ties together? I will now try to outline. So, why are we at the break point of history? I have two arguments for that. Number one, we are at the end of a long wave. There is, most of he, us here have heard that already, multiple scholars that argue that the, the capitalist economy comes in long waves uh, and that each end of a long wave we find ourselves in a new economic reality and therefore new institutions need to emerge to adapt to that new reality, and if they don't, we will be stuck in limbo. Uh, among, amongst the, the authors that have argued that is, I think, most importantly, uh, Perez, who argues that with innovation, the, in, in the intersection with innovation and uh, finance, and then Pelly, who would argue that over a Minsky super cycle, so uh, gradually increase of these financial cycles that Minsky argued. A second reason why I would uh, argue that we are at the breakpoint of history, so at the point where there will be change, is that we have seen uh, escalating inequality over 30 years, and the most important thing I think in that is that we've seen 30 years of stagnant wages and across and in most uh, Western countries and most um, of the, the developed world. And that has the following effect, that I think now people are looking at their children to identify one channel, and they're seeing actually they might not get the same living standards as I had. And I think that uh, creates fear and loathing, and this will escalate if it's not addressed. Now, technocratic institutions, I think, are changing because they have noticed that, and I called it as, I will, I will call that the liberal elite, quite provocatively, is turning towards Keynesianism. How do I uh, find that? Well. Let's just see what uh, the head of the ECB in 2010 said <laughs> about uh, fiscal consolidation. It was the strict Ricardian view may provide a reasonable estimate for the likely effects of consolidation. And uh, then we should look at what the head of the central bank is saying now. In 2017, he calls the past fiscal policy, of course, it's very diplomatic language always. So he's definitely uh, referring to the austerity as being a headwind, and now it's at least not a headwind anymore, but it's also not a tailwind. And there's countless other examples. Uh, the IMF is re releasing reports that are calling, called tackling inequality. Uh, the OECD and also Draghi in the ECB in 2017 are talking about the wageless recovery in which they argue at least partially that these uh, non-increasing wages are due to bargaining power. But I think this might have been too late, um, and the reason for that is, why is it too late? Uh, 
politics is in a trap now. And two reasons for this trap of cynicism. They need to, if you are a politician and not uh, a technocrat, you care about being voted into office. And it's very hard to do a U-turn. So a Angela Merkel needs to do everything to kind of stick with her initial narrative of 2009 to 2011. Um, and that was the pigs, they provocatively again, have to do their homework. Uh, that was, we're going to write fiscal consolidation into our constitutions and everything will be fine. And however, we see that this is constantly being broken. So there is between what Angela Merkel says, because she needs to stick to her narrative, and what's actually happening, there is a huge gap. So the mastery criteria are not being adhered to, which is a good thing, but still there is a gap. Uh, the fiscal contradiction is slowly being rolled back. There is secret debt write-offs that are not being uh, openly communicated. And I would argue the central bank is always presented as this independent institution, but it's probably not that independent anymore if it sits in the Troika and negotiates uh, with governments that are in the programs, their budgets. So I, I guess people see that and they feel that there's something wrong. And the second thing is, these mainstream parties, and I think that's a, a major reason also, are constantly proclaiming that everything is fine. When probably for a lot uh, of people, for a large part of the population, nothing is fine. Uh, they haven't seen their wages increasing, uh, rents are going up, uh, unemployment in a lot of countries doesn't go down, and if it goes down, it's even Draghi does uh, say that now, it's with not very high quality jobs. Now, that gives populism, populists, the opportunity to respond to that vacuum. I call it the vacuum of uh, cynicism. So they can point at the gap between what politicians' narrative is and what they're doing, and they can propose two things. They can either say, we're actually going to stick to the European rules, and we're not like Merkel giving money secretly to the South. That's, I think, what the AfD does, and was also in, in Austria quite successful with uh, their right-wing populists and uh, also Kurds. Or, and then it comes more from the left, they just say, oh, we are actually going to change everything and we're going to radically transform the EU or abolish the EU. And I think the second, this acknowledging that nothing is fine, might be the reason why a clown who didn't want to win won the US American presidency against a very established politician, how he just toured around the country saying, nothing is fine, everything is pretty bad, while... Uh, Hillary Clinton constantly proclaimed, everything's great, we're doing fine, and I guess people just uh, didn't feel comfortable with that anymore. So as a general uh, reflection that we would like to pose, uh, is that there is a rise in populism, uh, in which if we want, uh, in a way, to counteract it, it's very important the coordination between technocratic institutions and politics, uh, persuading uh, full employment and growth, and especially regarding this link uh, between the rise of inequality and uh, inequalities and um, populism, uh, that the distribution of income becomes uh, an, an issue in itself and uh, a policy uh, that the European Central Bank uh, takes really into account. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Uh, <laughs> If that is fine with you, Monsieur, uh, I would now give you the opportunity to, to respond if yeah. you want to. Sure. Uh, I guess five to ten minutes, and then I'd open the floor if you can. You're <coughs> more than welcome to come back to the front. Do you do you have a, a copy of your uh, your slides? No, it's a. I, I will be. I can, I could look at it. Uh, you can go yeah. through it, of course. Uh, just use these arrows of left and right. Okay. But Oops. Just be careful that the black cable doesn't unplug, the power cable is not Okay, powerful. fine. So I will concentrate on, on, on a few, few remarks. For instance, I, uh, I would say that uh, the uh, synthesis that, that you made were, was very interesting, obviously. And uh, there are points where uh, I am very much in agreement with and others where I would express, uh, for the sake of the discussion, some uh, 
some disagreement. Um, on the uh, idea that uh, we were um, in a world, we are in a world where there is now uh, blurring uh, frontiers, borders between central banks, governments, other, I would say, public or private entities, and that the central bank are uh, in a universe where uh, independence might be challenged, their independence might be challenged, and uh, or it has to be recognized that uh, they are not independent anymore. Uh, I understand that uh, these remarks are made by you and by others. I am not sure that it captures exactly the situation. Uh, when uh, there are several ways of looking at it. One is to be pragmatic and reflect on w what happened exactly. I have to tell you that I did not consult anybody when we decided to purchase the treasuries of um, some countries. Uh, and it, we had the feeling, and it was the case, that we were on the basis of our own mandate, our own independence, even if it was considered by some public opinion, including in Germany, as something which was profoundly abnormal, all editorial I had <laughs> the next day after having purchased the Greek, Irish, and the Portuguese treasuries were negative, all without any exception. And I understand that it was crucially because the political promise of the founding father of the euro as a single currency, namely, uh, certainly, uh, Chancellor Kohl, Theo Weigel, and so forth, had been, we are merging the currencies, we are not touching the budget. Everybody remains fully responsible of its budget. And, uh, it has to be fully understood. The German people can be tranquil. They will not touch the budget of the others. They only are merging their currency. That political promise was not made in the other countries. And by the way, it was not uh, incorporated in the treaty. Uh, the, the treaty was saying no subsidies to the others, but he was not saying you cannot lend to other countries, or it certainly didn't say that the central bank could not purchase treasuries. On the contrary, it was explicitly mentioned that the central bank, of course, as all central banks in the world, could purchase treasury. So I mentioned, I mentioned that en passant. The decision itself was independent. It could be interpreted as it is under the instruction of the government that you did that. But it's not the case. It was not the case. And uh, if we do that again in the future, it would not be the case. It's, it was on the basis of our own mandate ensure uh, price stability and sure the issuing of the currency in all the euro area as long as countries are members of the euro area it is not for us to decide for us the central bank then we have to care for the transmission of monetary policy to be as um, good as possible and uh, for that transmission to be as good as possible the spreads between the lowest spread uh, the lowest uh, level in Europe and uh, these particular uh, treasuries had to be, as I would say, going back to normal as possible. It was the reasoning we had. I think it has been accepted by, the, um, by justice in Europe very well. There is even a paradox of the independence of central banks, because generally, and it, I, I can see it, it's your vision, more or less, uh, governments are good guys. Uh, political sphere is extremely uh, legitimate. And uh, you have these uh, orthodox people <laughs> in the central banks that are resisting. So if we give too, more, too, too much independence to these uh, technocrats uh, guys in the central banks, uh, we are not uh, going in the right direction. That, that's one view. I have to say it's not what I experience. What I experience is a number of decisions that we took ourselves, that the Fed took in the US, would have not been taken by the political sphere. In the crisis, clearly, the, the Congress in the US was not on board 
for uh, starting immediately the TARP program, for instance, you remember that. And the criticism on the central bank, that the central bank had been much too kind, much too lenient, much too, uh, I would say, uh, 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 kindly uh, mobilized uh, to avoid uh, the drama, is something which was a very, uh, very strong criticism. In Europe, as I told you, all editorial, not only in Germany, probably in the Netherlands, has to be checked, uh, probably also a large part in Austria, and in large part of Europe, were very negative on the decision we took. So, independence can play in the reverse. Because the central bank is very close to the situation, because it is on the front line, because it sees when uh, we are threatened of total destabilization, we happen with our independence to take from time to time decisions that would be impossible politically. At least as long as the, the general people uh, do not, does not understand that the world is collapsing. When they understand that the world is totally collapsing, then it's too late. It might be too late. Uh, you, you could have run everywhere <laughs> and uh, the people must, must be, might be co totally panicked. So I draw your attention to that. Of course, it's, valu it's a valuable argument in times of crisis. And you will tell me, OK, put aside, let's put aside time of crisis. We are in normal time. One of your implicit uh, understanding of the situation, again, even in normal time, is that we say, the Kanzlerin, <laughs> Germany, maybe central banks, uh, maybe myself, we are too much orthodox and not sufficiently understanding. Just cut in no? for a second, because I, th I actually would make a little bit of the opposite of the argument. I would say the technocratic institutions were quicker in learning than politics and are better in learning in politics. And they were independence defined as they shouldn't finance governments, for example, but they did it secretly anyways. Secretly? Not, not secretly, sorry, that was the wrong word. But um, <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of bending to, to achieve it. It was in the secondary market, et cetera, et cetera. And, and just from a, for example, German public opinion perspective, they felt it was something fishy and then at the same time, it's still independence. And I think there should be, this, this contradiction should be a bit resolved. And that's what we mean by independence uh, should maybe should be recognized that there needs sometimes to be some coordination between the two. That's what we mean when we say independence is not always a good thing. No, I take your point. I take your point. <laughs> and uh, of course, I, uh, I uh, would argue myself that uh, uh, Every meeting of the governing council of our own central bank uh, is uh, uh, with the presence of the commission and of the president of the Eurogroup. Every meeting of the Eurogroup is with the presence of the, the governor of the central bank, president of the central bank. The central bank goes five times a year in the European Parliament. And so the, the, the the idea that there is no communication is absolutely plain wrong. I mean, there is, it's the tradition also of the Bundesbank, by the way. There is a lot of communication between the executive branch, the parliament, and, and the central bank. Uh, it remains true that the treaty says, uh, in your decision, thou shall not take any instructions from any entity not only uh, receive, uh, but even, even ask for any instruction. But I remain very, very strongly in favor of the independence of central banks. I fully accept that in exceptional times, it's absolutely clear that uh, there are areas where <laughs> which are more or less blurred. And the main, but the main problem for me is more that the, the central banks are given not, not only price stability, uh, I put aside the United States of America, which is a special case. Uh, and it is also the only case where the central bank has been very heavily criticized. Uh, in, when I go in the US, I see that the right of the Republican Party, the left of the Democrats, have very strongly criticized the central bank, which is not the case, I have to observe, in, in Europe. 
frankly speaking. There are, of course, uh, people, e even in Germany, that we are not happy at all. But when you look at the uh, overall debate, the central bank, I mean, the central bank is not attacked, per se, as an institution and as an independent institution. People are unhappy. They're also unhappy with the government because, after all, they, they say both have uh, crossed the border that, uh, that existed before. Uh, so, but, but I, don't, I, I don't remember how many minutes you're giving me now, because I have two other uh, points to make. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so I spoke of the uh, independence of the central bank. Oui, the main contradiction, of course, is that you're, you're given financial stability on the one hand, and uh, price stability, uh, uh, of course, as the, the main. Alors, so how to, do you combine the two? I understand there has been a lot of uh, work. Lavoie, Lavoie has worked on that uh, very, very much. Uh, my, my understanding is that uh, there is a primary goal, which is price stability, and we have to let that as a primary goal. There is another goal, which we have to fully accept, and uh, which, which is more or less related to the first, because if you don't have financial stability, then you fall either on the side of inflation or on the side of deflation. That's absolutely clear. There, there is a, there is a, a very slow, uh, I would say, a short uh, a path where you have the both risk of inflation and deflation if you embark on uh, financial instability and I'm not sure that the existence of macro prudentials, which is the, the usual way, uh, uh, at least in my own understanding, the uh, academia solved the problem in saying, well, you, uh, fortunately, the central bank have their main goal of price stability, and then macro prudentials are there with the influence or even the decision of the central bank to care with the uh, overall uh, financial stability. And uh, with these two two weapons uh, uh, for two goals, it works, and it can work. Uh, one can dispute that, that, that the uh, macro prudentials are sufficient, even macro prudentials plus micro prudentials, because as I said, most central banks now have the responsibility of banking surveillance. So I'm, I am myself uh, not convinced that uh, we, um, it seems to me that it is really an area where academia has to continue to work very, very hard, obviously, because uh, I am not satisfied with the present state of the, of the art. Even if, as you could see, I was taking some, you know, uh, pride for the ECB, which has exactly the same goal today, the same concept of monetary policy, to consider that having an eye of the uh, credit dynamics is something which is important even when you take your day-to-day uh, -day monetary policy decision. On the uh, escalation of inequality, end of the long wave and so forth, uh, to complement what has been said, I'm not in disagreement with what has been said, but I would say don't forget that the problem of our employees, our workers in the advanced economy since, say, why not the last 20 years, 30 years, is that they are under the competition of India, China, and it will go on and on and on, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, and so forth. So wha what I see as the main driver for all the difficulties that we have is not that we have uh, very bad people taking control of the advanced economy and uh, exerting maximum pressure on, the, on their own people. Uh, and you see so something which would be extremely bad. I it exists. Uh, some are taking advantage of the situation. That's obvious. But the main problem is that we had a goal, right or wrong, that uh, India, China, Brazil, Mexico should come at our level. And of course, this is not easy to operate and is a problem, not for those who are very well educated in the advanced economy, not for those who have uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, capacity to surf 
over the technological wave and globalization. But for the normal people, the small guy, the small guy is really put because of that, because of uh, not globalization, quote unquote, but because of the rise of uh, India, China, uh, Mexico, Brazil, and the like, in a situation which is very obviously very difficult. And the last point, and I conclude on that, I will give you two figures, and you will meditate on the two figures. Uh, we start the euro at a certain moment, and then every nation uh, is managing itself. Uh, gives wages and salaries increase in, uh, to the civil servant in, in their own country. From the beginning of uh, uh, 99, huh, start of the euro area, real start of the euro area, up to the start of the sovereign risk crisis. Following, uh, listen to the figure. Augmentation of wages and salaries in the civil service, average euro area from 99 to uh, end of uh, 2009, start of the sovereign risk crisis, 36%, plus 36% in euro. Greece, plus 117%. In Euro. Ireland, 110. Spain, 70. Average of the Euro area, 36. Germany, 20. 20% 20 augmentation from the start of the Euro up to the start of the Euro crisis. Who's rich? Who's poor? The same currency, the same purchasing power. Globally, the same cost, globally. So, good management. If you want to get full employment, as long as you don't have full employment, be able to understand that there is an arbitrage between what you give your people today and employment. The German demonstrated brilliantly that when you had mass unemployment, to be very, very keen on controlling uh, the overall cost in the economy was the good way to arrive to full employment. But Germany is prosperous, not because they are rich. They are prosperous because they, they managed uh, in the best way possible to arrive to full employment. That's my understanding. And so we have to be very careful when we oversimplify situation in, in uh, saying, uh, I'm, not, I'm French, I'm not German. <laughs> so, you know, they are the bad, the bad German, and they are always lecturing and lecturing and lecturing, and they are too orthodox. And the very good uh, Greek, to, to oversimplify, I mean, both are, were in their culture, were in their social partner uh, concept, uh, but one has to take also in account the realities. It's not easy for the Greeks uh, to uh, avoid themselves to augment wages and salary by 117% when it is possible, when it is financed by the rest of the world, when everybody uh, agrees to finance. You remember they, they ended their uh, own trip at minus 15% of the GDP of current account deficit and minus 15% of the GDP of budget deficit. So uh, it was a situation which was absolutely clearly not sustainable at all. And even the wealthiest country of the world would not say, OK, co continue like that. I will give you 15% of their GDP every year. That was not possible. A correction was necessary. So I, I say that only to, to counterbalance uh, some of what you said. And as I said, I was very much in agreement with many of what you said. Thank you so much. I'm sure there is a big res demand now for comments. And I will take three to four per round, if that's OK with you, and then you can collect. Yeah, yeah. OK. Hello. Hi. OK. okay. Um, uh, my question is, uh, is the same way like this uh, about uh, independence, in the, the, about the fiscal policy and uh, monetary policy and the yeah. things and this independence. Um, first thing, okay, you are discussing about the independence of, 
of uh, central bank and government. But um, in your text and your uh, speech before, you talk about some uh, ref inter institutional reform, reform and uh, labor reform uh, and fiscal reform to to central bank uh, acts. So now you are in a different way to the now the the government is dependent of the central bank. Now it's the opposite. So we have this, this situation. Before uh, the crisis, the, the debate was a uh, uh, central bank uh, needs to be uh, independent of government or not. Now it's the opposite. The government is independent of uh, central bank or not. And this is my question. And the second question in this way, in this same uh, approach, is to understand, um, OK, um, uh, we have maybe it's important we are talking about this uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy uh, in different ways, but um, if you have a restrictive uh, policy, monetary and a fiscal expansion, uh, you have a, a problem, of course, because of have a problem about debt and this pro this approach. So we have a, a problem about this and how manage it. First of all, what you said is exactly what. Uh, Wolfgang Schauble said at the time, he said, uh, I, I fully respect the independence of the central bank, but uh, I have to make the point, government also are independent of the central bank uh, themselves. And it's absolutely, it goes without saying. You know, uh, the, but nevertheless, it, it is certainly uh, the responsibility of the central bank to say from time to time, we are not the only game in town. We, we do all what we can, and it seems to me that they can prove, the central banks, that they did all what they could in very difficult circumstances, including, as we already said, in taking decisions that would not have been taken at the same moment by the governments because they would have considered too bold. So that, that's a proof of responsibility, if I may. But it's absolutely clear that you cannot tell the, the central bank, now take the situation, the structural uh, environment where you are, the uh, overall, uh, I would say, functioning of all markets in your economy, the overall uh, level of uh, uh, public spendings and uh, investment in, uh, in uh, R&D and so forth, as it is, we won't change anything, and now up to you, so we want uh, full employment. Well, that, 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 that is ridiculous, of course. Uh, and uh, on, only to give you one example, if a country augments the wages and salaries in the civil service by 117% when another one augments it by uh, 20%, you cannot expect that one is competitive uh, and you have uh, to expect that the other would be, would be very competitive. Maybe it is overdoing the things. Uh, maybe uh, it's not an optimal at all uh, in both cases, but, but you, you might have enormous differences that are totally out, of course, of the responsibility of the central bank. It's particularly the case in Europe where you have various countries with various culture and various social partners, uh, uh, I would say, uh, chemistry. Uh, but it is also true uh, in a centralized country, it's also true. Uh, I mean, you, you have all the decisions that are taken by these, the social partners that are decisive, and the central bank uh, is, uh, has only a meager influence in this domain, uh, and certainly not the monetary policy uh, per se. And then you have, of course, uh, all the structural, uh, uh, I would say, framework of, the, of, the, of that economy. You have. Uh, you have the, the decision to invest more or less uh, and to consume more or less, uh, etc. So uh, I think that uh, it is the duty of the central bank to tell the other partners all what it sees and it understands uh, without, of course, substituting to them in any respect. Uh, and that, that is something which I trust is... Uh, is legitimate and the governments are fully uh, of course independent by, by definition not only the governments but but the, po the democracy the political democracy the, the parliament after all it is the decision of the parliament as a last resort to give you an idea of where i i i am myself in terms of democratic accountability of the governance of the euro area uh, i i was 
saddened to see that uh, when there was a potential disagreement between one particular country and the recommendation of the European institution, for instance, uh, the Council, the, the Commission and the Council, or the Eurogroup, are saying, country X, you should do this and that. And country X says, no, I don't want austerity, or I don't want this or that. Then um, there was no way of solving the problem. The only way of solving the problem was to have successive uh, European Council, where you would uh, have a happening, and they, the rest of the world would expect either they are, have no agreement or they have an agreement, and uh, it's always dramatic. My own, uh, I would say, uh, recommendation would be that we would have a change of the treaty in order for the European Parliament in the format of the euro area to have the last word. They would say, well, finally, country X, Greece, say, is right, and they should not do that, uh, and we, the Parliament, decide that they should not do that. Or they are wrong and they should do that. Uh, so that you would have a process that would be unchallengeable because it would be democratic. The representative of the people would decide and then uh, nobody would uh, be able to challenge that, at least democratically. Uh, I don't want to yeah? repeat on you, but I think yeah? time being a uh, scarce resource, okay. we should uh, allow others. Yeah, yeah, yeah of, course, of course, of course, of course. But, but there was a, another question, and maybe I could say uh, just one word on the second part of your question, which was... <laughs> different uh, ways from monetary policy, fiscal policy... Yeah, yeah, the policy mix. The, the policy mix. Uh, in my opinion, from the standpoint of the central bank, the uh, decisions that are taken by the, the parliament, after all, we are speaking of the budget, parliament, uh, are uh, imposing, imposed to the central bank. So the central bank taking uh, its, its own mandate as to uh, deliver the uh, element of the policy mix that corresponds to its own uh, goal and mandate. And uh, of course, again, as I said, it, it could say, we recommend you to be uh, more, uh, uh, I would say, uh, orthodox, say, quote unquote, or wise. <laughs> I would prefer wise <laughs> to orthodox uh, in your own handling of your budget. I could say that in France, and eh? it's not very <laughs> difficult. France has a very bad handling of its. Uh, budget, uh, uh, policy, fiscal policy, very, very bad, obviously. And uh, uh, it would be normal for the central bank, which the central bank does, to say uh, you should correct that. But what w the decisions that are taken are totally imposing themselves, of course, to the central bank, which has to deliver financial stabi price stability and financial stability, taking into account the environment in which uh, it is placed which, of course, is particularly complicated for the ECB because the ECB has 19 sovereign countries in front of her and two more, perhaps 20, uh, quite, quite rapidly. Okay, if, that, if it's okay for you, I would collect... Two, two, two or three, yeah, yeah. So it's neither... Right. Yeah, so it's neither Um, I'm Louisa, I'm from option A, which is the innovation option. Um, given the post-financial crisis context, uh, I would like to know which is your uh, take on uh, cryptocurrencies. On, um, on the cryptocurrencies? Cryptocurrencies, yeah. Um, okay. Do you think uh, will it be possible to regulate it or will it lead to a more deregulation path? Um, and which impacts do you see for the financial system? Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Ryan. I'm from Option B from Ireland. Um, you spoke during your talk about uh, efforts to contain the government bonds differentials at the time of the debt crisis, um, or at the peak of the debt crisis, maybe I should say. Um, I wanted to ask for your thoughts on the Eurobond proposals that have been uh, more popular since this time, um, where we see various uh, economists across the mainstream and the heterodoxy um, argue that perhaps it's time for a bond that is common to all European countries. If you thought that was favorable, I would like to hear 
what exactly you would think makes for a good euro bond. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a, a specific uh, question. As you mentioned in your introduction, uh, the UCB uh, decided to supply unlimited amount of liquidity, especially on October 8, 2008. And you also mentioned that an important innovation was the uh, currency swap arrangements among uh, central banks. And uh, in, uh, on October uh, 13, the Federal Reserve decided to uh, supply full allotment uh, format to the uh, UCB at a fixed rate. So uh, there are reasons to think that uh, the UCB influenced uh, the um, Federal Reserve uh, concerning uh, the Federal Reserve's decision on October uh, 13. Okay. So, uh, first, um, cryptocurrency, uh, I must confess that uh, I cannot accept the qualification currency given to the Bitcoin or to the other cryptocurrency because as I am aware, uh, the uh, currency, uh, money, must have three characteristics. It must be a, a good, in, a good uh, I would say, instrument of account, a good instrument to, uh, of exchange, and uh, it should keep its value. That's the characteristic of, uh, of money. Uh, and uh, if I'm not misled, it is Aristotle uh, who <laughs> said that it was the characteristic of money. Uh, of course, uh, the Bitcoin is not a store of value at all. It's a, a speculative instrument under our eyes. It's very interesting because for the, the young people that have no memory of uh, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, speculation, uh, that, that is under your eyes a fantastic speculation. And uh, uh, it, it, we, perhaps we have to go back to the tulip of the, ne of the Dutch <laughs> to, to see such extraordinary uh, speculation. So uh, what to do with that? Uh, if it is, and one of the characteristics is also anonyma, uh, the, the anonymous uh, transaction and so forth, it seems to me it's scandalous. We are fighting everywhere in the world against financing of terrorism, um, financing of crime, organized crime, or, uh, I would say, transaction and so forth, not to speak of the financing of terrorism. It's absolutely uh, incredible that we could let uh, billions and hundreds of billions of dollars of transaction that would, be, uh, that would not be uh, uh, controlled. And uh, so uh, it seems to me that there we have a, a very big problem. By the way, the explosion of the amount uh, of uh, of the, the, the market value of those cryptocurrencies is such now that it is a problem at a global level, a real problem at a global level. Uh, and uh, I expect that uh, more and more control would be exerted. I never understood why at the very beginning a lot of uh, cultures and countries were so keen on letting you know, uh, uh, the uh, experiment uh, taking uh, such a, a dimension. Uh, particularly, I have to say, in the Anglo-Saxon world, it, the idea that everything should be explored, which is a, a fantastic uh, uh, dimension of the, of the American culture in particular, uh, in that case, uh, gave some kind of impetus to, to the expansion. So all that being said, it seems to me that perhaps we could separate the uh, cryptocurrency itself from the blockchain, which is the underlying uh, real, uh, I would say, uh, uh, technological process uh, which, uh, in which the, the Bitcoin was only the uh, a way to uh, remunerate the miners. It was both, I would say, the instrument of account and a way to remunerate the miners. So. Uh, perhaps we can separate the blockchain, and I, I can see a lot of experience to see uh, to, to try to uh, utilize the blockchain technology, which is a very peculiar technology. 
I don't know exactly how they succeed in uh, remun remunerating the miners, those who are making the immense computation that are needed in the, that uh, decentralized ledger system. But, uh, but perhaps uh, we, we will see. It's true in any case that we have to, to be um, humble in front of the new technologies. And perhaps uh, we will have many, many new uh, uh, try that would prove at, at a time extremely effective without creating the problem of, uh, of, the, of the present cryptocurrency, both in terms of speculative uh, instrument and in terms of, as I said, uh, of uh, obscure instruments that are utilized uh, by uh, criminals or by, uh, I would say, those who, who want to, to, to hide uh, their money. Uh, as regards the euro bonds, uh, I would say that uh, uh, we have euro bonds already. Eh? The uh, issuance of the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, uh, are euro bonds. Uh, if you go to Luxembourg, you will meet people that are excellent, a, a real fantastic techno structure. Uh, they know uh, all the markets of the world. They are uh, issuing their own uh, bonds uh, everywhere in the world. And these are pure euro bonds. Uh, they, it is the signature of Europe which is on that. Of course, you have also the EIB bonds. And uh, you, have, you have a number of bonds that, are, uh, that have the signature of, uh, of uh, Europe. Now, if by euro bonds you mean that uh, uh, we would merge the treasuries of uh, the countries that are members of the euro area, and that uh, we would have uh, uh, a share of, uh, of uh, uh, I would say, sig signature between uh, the various uh, countries. I think it is quite unlikely that we will arrive that, to that. Because, uh, again, all the system relies upon the re still uh, the responsibility of the various countries concerned. And uh, you don't merge the bonds of uh, California and of Florida. You don't merge the, the, the bonds, the real bonds uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the uh, various countries that are in federation. You have the, the, the bonds of the Bund, the bonds of the federation itself. And if we are going to be more and more of a federation, which is one perspective for Europe, of course we will have the bonds. But I think that at the present moment, uh, we have the ESM, which is there precisely to help countries that could be in difficulty. Perhaps uh, we will call the ESM tomorrow the uh, European Monetary Fund. Uh, we have, you know, but again, I personally, I, ne I was never very much in favor of what my own country was asking for precisely to, to merge more or less uh, uh, the, uh, the, the bonds. Now, it's possible that we will discover that on a short-term basis, the bills, the, the very short-term notes, could be more or less merged partially. I, I, I don't elaborate too much on that. Uh, that, that is perhaps uh, possible. But uh, I, I think that now that the crisis is over, this idea that it is urgent to merge the treasuries of the various countries, which one could understood because, it, of course, if you had merged every, everything, uh, we, we would have solved the crisis. But the burden on the well-managed country in favor of the poorly managed country would have been so gigantic that politically it was not possible in any case. Uh, on the, uh, your question on, on the... Um, currency swap. First, first of all, I, I had no time, of course, to elaborate, but uh, it's been a, a fantastic help that we could have those uh, uh, generalization of currency swap. And uh, as you remember, it was uh, we had the collapse of uh, uh, Lehman Brothers the 15th of September 2008. So a Monday. The next Thursday, Thanks to the Fed and to the other central banks that were involved, we could communicate to all markets in the world. So only two days and a half after the uh, bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers that uh, we uh, had this agreement, 
which practically meant dollars are available everywhere in the world, provided you have collateral in your national currency. So it was a fantastic uh, uh, generalization. And of course, it played a very important role in uh, first uh, uh, demonstrating that there, were, there, were, uh, there, there was a crew in the cockpit of the world economy, and that, that crew in the cockpit of the global economy was able in two days and a half to work out a global uh, concept that would permit all uh, institutions in the world to think that they, they could get the dollar liquidity, which was, of course, what was bad. They were all incredibly badly in need of dollar. And uh, even in 07, I mentioned the decision we took to give liquidity on an unlimited basis on the 9th of August uh, 2007. It was because all uh, institutions of the world were tapping the euro in order to swap it against dollar. So it was not <coughs> the euro what, which was lacking, it was the dollar which was, uh, which was uh, totally, uh, they were all badly in need of dollar. So uh, whether or not this full allotment was, uh, uh, it's clear that it was our concept. Uh, I, I have to <laughs> recheck my note to see whether one could say, well, uh, we, we influenced sufficiently the US so that they could accept uh, uh, the idea of a, a full allotment. But clearly, it was the right and appropriate concept uh, at the time, because uh, Otherwise, we, uh, you know, the, the, the sentiment of lacking liquidity was so generalized uh, in this uh, crisis period that uh, the only way to reassure everybody was to say, you will, you will get all what you need, full stop. And then, of course, there was a general appeasement. That being said, as I, uh, as I said, we still do that in Europe, hmm? still do that in Europe which is also a measure of the fact that we are not in a normal situation yet. Do you have time for one last round? A short one or? Oh yes, yes I can, I can. Uh, if, if, uh, if it is 15 minutes, uh, then I, I Let's can. do it quickly. Uh, one, I think that was the order, two, three, four. Oh, but let's do you together yeah. so that bye I bye. have to run so much. You don't have a card on you. Thank J'allais justement vous écrire pour le renouvellement du master. Donc, je vous laisse une carte. Et mon collègue Emmanuel Carré va vous envoyer son nom. Voilà. D'accord. Je vous la laisse. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Au revoir. Pardon. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tichet, thank you for your uh, lecture. Uh, I'd like to pose a question regarding the 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 decisions in taken by the governing council in 2011 regarding the interest rate hikes in April and uh, July that were taken uh, because uh, there, there was clearly in inflation, headline inflation was at 2.6 percent, so we had uh, uh, pressures on headline inflation despite the core inflation was uh, still below 2 percent. Uh, we had uh, oil and food price hikes, uh, and uh, 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 the, my, my, my question would be, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, uh, other people uh, have uh, criticized the, the, because it uh, uh, eventually led to the, an increase in spreads from the periphery to the core. And then you, uh, uh, and in August, the, the governing council decided to uh, in, uh, broaden the SMP uh, uh, support to Italy and, and, and Spain. But uh, in, on, on, on take that, taking into the light of that episode, to understand better uh, the, uh, the weights of the price stability and financial stability roles, at least for the European Central Bank, as it does, doesn't have the, let's say, the uh, uh, unemployment uh, role as the Fed, uh, on light on that episode. And today for that, let's say, for our current situation, where we have still low inflation, but uh, uh, rising financial stability pressures with uh, some uh, increase in housing prices and uh, other asset prices. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm Ettore from Option B, from Italy. I have a question regarding uh, what happened before October 2008 in July um, with the decision of the ECB to raise the interest rates from 4 to 4.25%. So uh, a decision that in retrospect could be seen as wise as, a, uh, as running naked in the direction of the storm. And I would ask if you would still agree with that decision or after 10 years you would recognize that maybe price stability, w there were other problems uh, threatening the, the economies of the Eurozone in July. That you're speaking of July, which year? Uh, 2008. Eight. Okay. I'm Maria from Option B as well, uh, and I would like to ask actually two questions. First one goes on Germany and uh, the inflation bias of the German behavior <coughs> also inspiring the ideas of the European Central Bank. Uh, it has been argued in the post Keynesian literature that uh, actually Germany got it wrong and France would have gotten it right, not worrying so much about inflation, because what happens is that Germany ended up uh, being lucky and being able to sell its products in the international market. So it has been lucky because it uh, uh, has been profiting from actually the demand from the external sector and not from the domestic demand, which in Germany is very weak and at the moment is a bit recovering, but it's still not uh, the main uh, driver of German economy. So the first thing goes on in that direction. And uh, the second is uh, on the spillover effects of the quantitative policy, but I think also he already mentioned that on his question on the emerging markets. One last, where was it? Yeah. And then that's it. Bonjour Cliché, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Adga, I'm from Option B. And in the same spirit as my colleague question about Eurobonds, I would like to ask about your opinion on the Eurozone finance position, finance minister position. I'm aware that you were, uh, you were already pro about the opinion on 2011, and I would like to ask whether you are, you are still maintaining the same level of support about that, uh, about that perspective. And as well, whether do you think that there is also some argument that it, is, it doesn't have the same amount of urgency as, uh, as it was in 2011, and some person uh, argue that some other measures such as a more convergence tax, tax regulatory in European Union is more needed and more urgent than the Eurozone's final minister position right now. But what do you think about that? Thank you. Thank you. So I have a, a new batch of uh, fa four questions. Huh? Is this, this is the last batch. That's Wait. the last batch. Last batch. Okay. Uh, so uh, on the, uh, I could uh, maybe mention the interest rates uh, increase uh, together because we have two questions on that. Uh, I would say, of course, we, we are in uh, situations that are very different uh, from uh, uh, the situation which we, we knew after, uh, long after. In 11, my memory, and that has to be rechecked, it was that um, we were observing, and we were very happy with that, of course, uh, a recovery which was quite uh, visible and uh, there was in the governing council of the ECB the sentiment that uh, some um, social partners and it was the, the case in particular in Germany which we were used to a, a very very cautious attitude of the social partners the union in Germany but <coughs> we had the sentiment that uh, because of the uh, very high level of inflation which was uh, much higher than before. There was a call for uh, a change in their own, uh, in their overall attitude. And uh, one of the reasons was that we wanted, be with this very small augmentation, to signal that we were still vigilant and uh, we didn't want to lose control of the overall negotiations which were taken. It was only a signal. Uh, we were not expecting that it would have a big influence, but it was a signal. On the other hand, we wanted also to demonstrate to the, and, and that in that sense, uh, you see the accountability of a central bank. We wanted to give credit to the idea that we could take 
any non-conventional measures that we wanted to take. The SMP on Greece, Ireland, and Portugal was something which had been very heavily criticized, uh, but that uh, we wanted to be able to do again, and we did again, after these uh, uh, increases, as has been mentioned in the case of, uh, of uh, Italy and, and Spain, massively. And I personally wanted to be absolutely clear on the fact that we were inflexible on price stability and inflexible on our capacity, even if it was heavily criticized by, uh, by many, including by entire public opinion, uh, that we were inflexible to be able to push the button if it was necessary, if needed. And that might be, I mean, I have no time to elaborate much more, and I would, I would uh, like very much to give you the figures in, in order to see in which context it was, uh, it was done. Now, you will you will say uh, uh, you were probably in the governing council too optimistic on the cycle, and uh, you you were thinking that uh, even after the problem you had in Greece uh, and uh, in some other countries, uh, the, the the business cycle in Europe was more or less following the global business cycle of the advanced economy, which happened not to be the case. Uh, and particularly, of course, because as long as we had only three small countries that were hampered by uh, their own difficulty, uh, it was not a heavy burden on the overall GDP of the euro area. But if Spain and Italy were blocked and had no, uh, no more financing, uh, then, of course, we had a totally different environment and uh, we had the uh, drama, if I may, of almost 40% of the euro area being blocked. So that would be the comment I, I would give to, to this um, remark. Uh, on, on July 2008, I would say uh, it was uh, something that uh, uh, we had uh, uh, in mind. Of course, we were not extra lucid. Uh, we could not uh, uh, foresee that uh, we would have uh, uh, the uh, Lehman Brothers uh, collapse. Uh, of course, immediately after the Lehman Brothers collapsed, we took all the decisions that were necessary. In any case, nobody can say it is because we took a decision in July 08 in Europe that uh, we triggered the drama in the United States of America. We were in a two different, uh, different uh, environment. But again, uh, uh, have in mind that it was criticized also heavily what we had done in 07. The fact that we gave uh, 95 billion euros of liquidity to all uh, commercial banks in Europe was considered, particularly in Germany, but not only in Germany, as something which was too bold. And we were even criticized, by the way, by some uh, in, in the UK that uh, bef I mean, it lasted not very long, but it, we had some criticism. And the more, uh, the highest level of criticism we had when we did the same at the end of year 07, when we gave a full allotment for, in my memory, for 15 days, and we were asked something like 500 billion euros. So an enormous amount, half a trillion euro, which were asked. And I wanted always to be able to say there is some kind of separation principle, we will do all what is necessary in the non-conventional extraordinary measures, whatever they are, whether it is SMP or whether it is full allotment of, uh, of liquidity, but we are also inflexible of, on uh, stability, uh, price stability. And I have to say that if I want, I don't want to put the argument too strongly, but when I look at the inflation expectations, the stabilization of our inflation expectations, avoiding risks of, uh, of inflation, but also risks of deflation, had been very, very solid in comparison with the US. If you look at the US, you would see the inflation expectations were going up and down, up and down, and very, very low down. Uh, in our case, uh, perhaps because the central bank was deemed to be extraordinarily, I would say, determined 
to anchor inflationary expectations, the volatility of, in, of our inflation expectations was extremely uh, meager. Is Germany right or France right in comparison with Germany? If I understand well the question, bec because of the at absence of attention that France g gave to, to inflation, is that right? Uh, Yeah, but um, my, my understanding, my, un, my understanding really is that uh, Germany is exporting a lot. The dominant culture in Germany of the social partners, both I would say entrepreneurs and unions, is we have to be competitive if we want to be uh, to preserve job and and to create new jobs possibly, but to preserve job, and and that is the dominant culture because uh, private enterprises that are exporting are uh, very, very numerous. The dominant culture in France is much more the culture of the civil service, big utilities, non-exporting entities. And it's, it's a pity because, because of course, those uh, social partners do not, both entrepreneurs and unions, they don't see the importance of being competitive of having clients, of having clients uh, domestically and uh, abroad in order to uh, preserve jobs and so forth. So I, would, I have absolutely no hesitation to say that Germany was right. I mean, if, and I guess that it is the main thrust here, and I fully share that thrust, the main success is full employment. You, are not for, you should not be forgiven for having mass unemployment eternally. It's your fault. There is absolutely no doubt it is your fault. So if the goal is full employment, of course, France has a very bad behavior because there, uh, there is still mass unemployment in France. When we were less touched by unemployment uh, in this country than in Germany at the very beginning of the 2000s. So uh, I have no hesitation to say no, I, I think really, I mean, then you can say Germany is overdoing it. Now, they have full employment, but they continue to be very moderate in their uh, augmentation. And that, that is not normal. Uh, it's not the, the <laughs> a market economy as it should function. Even my friend uh, Jens uh, uh, Weidmann uh, told the unions in Germany one year ago, one year and a half ago, oh, you're, you're not demanding enough. You should, de you should be more demanding, which is very paradoxical. But it's true. It's so that there is a, I mean, in a way, wage moderation functions so well to deliver full employment that it's difficult for the union to say, now we, we change our culture. Finance minister, yes, I think that uh, uh, it's uh, important that we have one brain that would not have any conflict of interest would be concentrating on the management, the, I would say the financial, economic, fiscal management of the euro area, uh, without being simultaneously minister in a particular uh, nation, or uh, being simultaneously the uh, commissioner of both uh, the European Union and the euro area. So in my opinion, this man or women will have uh, in his mind all the uh, uh, overall um, uh, responsibility of uh, uh, giving, uh, I mean, all their, um, their importance to the, manage to the uh, overall governance of the euro area. After all, the euro area is a single market with a single currency, size of the United States of America, immense responsibility, and all the responsibility that uh, a Minister of Finance might have in the domain of, uh, of the governance I mentioned. But on top of that, I mean, in a very complicated uh, uh, constellation of various countries, and I, as you could see uh, in all what I said, the difference of behavior between countries, or the potential uh, difference of behavior, or the real actual uh, difference of behavior is something which is extremely important. Uh, in the EU area. Unique, there is no other entity of that kind in the world, and we are still, of course, uh, learning by doing. 
So thank you very much indeed.